I, I want to emphasize a few things from the first unit, and some of you have already done the second unit of the material because we're we're building this course week by week. Um, and the first thing, really, when we go through, if you remember the idea about why we sing and all the uh, practical reasons for why we sing, um, our our faith, and the the sense of um, the acoustical reasons that you can fill a space with sound and if you're working with your with your children who are taking this as a credit course or your younger children who may be doing it for enrichment um, really have them experiment with the, the singing voice. This isn't about how well you sing. It's absolutely not. Um, but get in some kind of place in your house or in your church or in a, a big space and try to fill sound with uh, space with a sound, a word. And then you know, try to sing that same word and see how it changes, how it feels. Um, see if you can get more expression through the sung word or the spoken word. I, I mean, word can be anything. It can be dog or it can be uh, wall or anything with a big vowel, you know. And then see what you can do to color the world, word in speech. You can use sacred words. You can say God. You can say um, praise. You can say any word you want. And see how you can color it in speech. And then see how you can color it in sound as you try to sing it. Because that is both the expressive where we can be more expressive in song than in speech, and the acoustical, where we can fill more space um, with singing. So that that's something I want you to you know try to to really experience for yourselves. Now, some of you may sing quite a bit in church and or in synagogue, and some of you may not be used to doing it at all. Um, then, of course, the other issue is the memory issue that that we spoke about. How the ancients could remember so very, very much text um, from generation to generation. We're, ta we're not talking lines; we're talking volumes of text. And so, uh, probably you've used this before in your learning and your training. But if not, I urge you to um, um, think, take something just new, and maybe if you can divide into teams or something, and see who can memorize it the fastest by singing it versus learning it in terms of text. Or you may be able to pull from nursery rhymes or songs you've learned in the past or um, poems that you've memorized. Have you used the sung word in order to, um, in order to um, shall we say, uh, use that mnemonic uh, um, strength of being able to memorize text through song? These are very human qualities, uh, the, these gifts that we have to remember text and to be able to do it better and more expressively and volume-wise more loudly through using the melody. Um, another thing uh, that, oh, I, I see now that I do have Paul on. Paul, are you there? I am the, here. Can you hear me? I can now. I, I wasn't sure you were on. I thought maybe... Okay, I mean, I've got to look in the right way. I didn't know if we'd managed to get connected, so I was just going on and on. Oh, Hi, Paul. Yeah, well. I'm, I'm happy to see you. Believe you me. <laughs> that was like one of those moments where you're doing, uh, you know, sports announcing, and you're not sure if the game started or not. Thank you. Right. <laughs> well, it was the last moment where I was finally able to uh, log in. So, but uh, you've been doing so well. Oh, uh, you're so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> well, I know you're a great lover of song and of of, of the sacred text song. Well, I am, and, and it has, uh, as I've visited synagogues, it is very interesting to see, you know, a, a similarity between, uh, like, your Gregorian chants, and, and then you go to a synagogue, and they do a very similar uh, type thing, whereas, you know, you brought that up, that learning the text, it really does help learn the text. And I really hadn't thought that. I, you know, I see it. It's such a worshipful act as it's happening. Um, but at the same time, like you said, you're learning so much, so volumes uh, of text there that I, I can see that being the case, especially as a father, as I'm teaching uh, my daughters, you know, various Bible verses and things like that. We're basically doing the same thing. So you're using sung melodies to help you help you do that, right? Right, right. Did and they like have, that? Uh, very much so. I mean, you know, if, if I teach them a say a Bible verse, and then all of a sudden we're we're having a 
well, usually it's me who's having the problems with it because they learn it before I do. But uh, mm -hmm. if we put it to music, and we we bought entire um, CDs with with uh, Bible verses, and then right after that Bible verse comes a song that was created around that Bible verse, and it seems to help solidify that that text. Well, so that's a long way of saying good point. Okay, I again, it's it. so important to know it's an ancient idea. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, let's think of some of the other points that are in that first unit, especially. Are there things that struck you, or things that you want to uh, think would be good for us to discuss today? Well, well you start out with with credo. Uh, the credo, the exactly. The faith. credo. Right. Can you tell us why you decided to start off that way? Well, one of the things we will do, and we want to do it not as directly as we could. I mean, you know, uh, but we want to make certain that we will very gradually expose all of the parts of ancient Christian worship that we today call the the foundation of the mass, which unified Christianity for a century, for a millennium and a half, basically, uh, and even after that, and even today, in ways that we often don't think it does. Um, but at any rate. Uh, you know, there's a couple ways you can go about learning it. Now, as a professor at SMU, and I had my freshman music majors, uh, and some of you probably have had this experience if you've taken music history, music appreciation, or cultural history. Everybody comes in, you sit down, and you learn it. You know, you've got to get in and a lot of other things about early uh, times learned quickly. But we don't want to do it quite that way in this course. We want to expose these parts of what will be called the ordinary um, you know, in a way that feels kind of organic, if you will. And so we started with the basic credo, I believe, I believe in one God. That statement of faith, uh, the one God, and we're using that as the opening of the course because monotheism with Judaism and Christianity, that's just such an important unifying fact. But the, uh, the idea of, of the Shema in, in Hebrew uh, is our God is one. You know, we wanted to bring that into unity. And that, that, was, that seemed to us the best and the strongest place to start, although it is not the opening sentences in the liturgy by any means for the Christian text. Oh, very good. Uh, the Shema, that's a, that's a great example, something that is, is recited daily by many families, both Jewish and Christian. Uh, can you get a little bit into the single line melody singing that you bring up in this course? Monody, you call it monody. Monody, monody. it's a great term. You should find 10 ways a day to use that word. I don't know where, but <laughs> it, you know, make you the hit of the party, I'm sure. It's well, but you sound smart, and that's what I'm taking this course for. Exactly. Well, we want all of our we want our kids to learn the basics, and we want our parents and tutors to to be even more sparkling in their conversation at parties, right? That's <laughs> that's part of what we do. I think all of us do, you know. But the, this monodic singing, which all you know, it's so funny to watch little children um, because they sing. They just as soon as they're able to develop mentally, they just start singing a single line melody of some sort. Some of it's better than others, you know. But singing a single line melody is what we as humans are capable of. We cannot sing harmony. Uh, we can accompany ourselves with little noises, but we can't create harmonies or chords on, with our own voice. At least most most people. Um, and and so this the strength of the single line melody unifies ancient cultures and ancient religions and ancient folk music. It is what people do from the time they're toddlers to if they don't get scared of singing to their last breath, basically. Um, and so it it it's it's the same it, to express text in music. Whether you're doing it in Hebrew or in Greek or in Latin, or you're going to do it in a single line melody, and that's a very, very strong expression of of, of creation, of faith, of of our living presence and being. You know, it's 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 almost what we do if we breathe out. Um, and yet, in our modern culture, we don't hear much monody, do we? No, I don't think so. And why is that? But why do you think it is? <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the spot. I don't know because I think of, I think of, as I, it just seems as I mature, as I've gotten older, I tend to personally lose that until my young ones in my life, until they sort of bring it back 
to me. I they start they start singing and dancing down the hall in the back of the car mm -hmm. and it's sort of wow you know I have lost that or you know but as far as socially I, I'm not really sure well I mean I think we lose it because most of what we hear through the electronically reproduced music that bombards us and I think everyone who's in our circle of scholars and everyone who's taking courses with us or studying you know cultural history seriously knows that we're all on a mission a campaign to drive out the bombardment of you can call it the modern world the secular world the whichever world we're missioning against at the moment but we are bombarded with a noise and b things that pretend to be music or purport to be music that are loud and so-called rich with lots of chords and boom and sound and big bass and you know the best example is when you drive up at a stoplight and you hear the mom 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 you know <laughs> you know there's a lot in between that and the melody line but is it is it an expression of music that fills our soul that's the question we are bombarded with this deep rich full acoustical sound and it makes us think that's what it's supposed to sound like if you're making good big music now if you're fortunate enough to have what we like to recall or don't like to call sometimes classical music or good Broadway music or good gospel or you know all the other kinds of music that are closer I think to a a more refined and a more um, useful to the soul kind of sound then you're probably more tuned to the beauty of monody but we we, we have the wrong models in our ear and we think that our little voice saying um, God be praised is not somehow good enough or big enough or beautiful enough or important enough or impressive enough and the children remind us that it is okay you just did you hit on something that that I was that I started to develop in my mind is that there's the music is so highly produced that I can't do that in my head hmm. and so rather than doing that sometimes we just we just give up or we just pop on the uh, the iPod and, and listen to that big mm -hmm. bass sound. Um, what about, okay. Well, Can and we give up for nothing because you and I. Yeah, go ahead. Oops. Well, no, I, yeah, we, have a, we had a little, you know, our satellite gave us a little tiny interruption. Oh, yeah. see, <laughs> look at us. We highly speak about highly produced. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, all of us together here that are listening, you know, look at, talk about highly produced. This is, and you know, we may look back on this in 10 years and think it was primitive technology. But, but it, we get up for that reason because we can't sound like the, um, um, the score to Les Miserables, you know, we can't do that all by ourselves. But we also give up because along the way, almost all of us get beaten down by somebody saying, oh, you sing ugly, or well, you don't sound good, or oh, don't sing, or, or parents who just think, you know, if I have three more toddlers singing at me in the back seat for another five minutes, I am going through the roof, you know. We are taught that singing is a disruption, we can't do it well enough, so personally we get beaten down, and all of us are probably guilty of this, we've experienced it, and we may have inflicted it don't you think I do think I mean you're you're convicting me right here you know <laughs> we have Sorry. Had to, all of us <laughs> we have had to instate a no humming rule at the dinner table because with four different people often singing four or humming four different songs at the same time uh, you know that that's what caused us to, to create that but sometimes the humming or the singing happens maybe even in the car while we're listening to something that we want to listen to, another song. A compl I don't even know how someone can do that because I can't even do that. But children, children can do it. They can do it. They can they can sing a completely different song that is playing, you know, than they're hearing. But um, you know, I you know, there's a word for that: heterophony. Really, really. <laughs> And in one of our uh, class sessions coming up, of course, this first session we, we laid out issues of basic chant and expression of sacred sentiment through song and the reasoning and the history of some of it and the, the notation, which we'll get to in a minute, I think. But our second unit, is, which is up and available for all our students, is on, we go back to Jerusalem. And, of course, we're so happy about that unit because it gives us opportunity to use a lot of the footage we were able to film in Jerusalem, which we're so grateful for that opportunity. But And then we're going to Greece in the third unit, which will be there and 
for everyone to explore. And But as we get a little further in, we're going to pick up more terminology. That's where I'm going with this. And we've got monody, and we'll be picking up polyphony. But we'll, heterophony is this idea of having different phones or sounds or melody lines. You can call it musical chaos if you want. But that's what you're having when they're all listening to one thing and singing three other things. They're having heterophony. Wow. <laughs> okay, what, what about uh, metrical and non-metrical? Can you okay. can you help me with these terms a little bit? Sure, um, and and you know that's a big big thing. And again, when I say big thing, I really want people to think internally. We've talked about singing and expression. We can talk about all the history and the terms and the you know we'll learn all that. We are learning all that in the course and in the assignments. But really, focus it all right back here. When I say big thing, I mean inside who we are. What's the first sound we all hear in our very first you know, expression of life in the womb, where we are. What's the first sound we hear, Paul? The heartbeat. Yeah, we all did it. We all did it. We already unified. Every one of us out there, I don't care where we are, we all experience ex exactly the same, you know, the same beat. We came out as rhythmic creatures, you know, mm -hmm. and we will carry that through. All right, that's the one thing. That's so we are metrical by our very nature. And our right now we've got a bunch of little pulses going on in us, and they're mostly regular, right? <laughs> but then we, you know, and if we could hear, if you know, if we really heard them all the time, we'd probably just you know jump out the something or other. But, but our speech does not follow that. Our speech is completely free-floating in meter. And the things we do, you know, if I pick something up and then I put it down and then I, and I move and it's all these different rhythms that are free-floating in what we do. You know, if we're eating soup, we might be reading a, a book too and we kind of put the spoon up and then we, oh, and then we get hungry and we eat fast and then, I mean, our, our actual being through space and time is free-floating and certainly our speech. It is not bop, 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 bop. It, our speech, our expression, our thought is non-metrical, but our human life is metrical in our, in our physiological origins and actions. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, make so sense? would it be fair to say that if my speech became metri metrical, I would be basically rapping? Um, well, if you were metrical in your speech, in your speech, it would need to be like this and very boring. <laughs> <laughs> but what about what about your rappers? I mean, that's ah. Now there you go. You see, they have made a type of melody that's based on putting making text. But even there, there's a great deal of variety. You know, there's a beat underneath, like that heartbeat. And then they're yeah. fitting, you know, sometimes, and of course, I can't do the style. I'm not trained in rap. They have a great deal of rhythmic variety, but there's still a pulse, you know. And, and basically, most of our songs, most of our, most of our popular music, most of the music, you know, Beethoven will be metrical, um, Mendelssohn will be metrical, Dvorak will be metrical, the Broadway will be metrical. Most of the music we listen to, a good deal of it is metrical, obviously, but, but chant was different. Chant didn't have that beat structure. It is dictated and generated. Let's think of that word. It is generated by the rhythm of the prose. And okay. that is what part of what makes it feel so sacred. Nice. You know? Okay. Can I can I detour just for a personal yeah. thing to ask you about a certain artist, Charlie Bird? Charlie okay. Bird. Not you're not familiar. Okay, jazz. Are we talking jazz? Bird. Okay, John. Yeah, the name first name was confusing. But yeah, Bird. Okay. And all Isn't the that... jazz, that whole period of jazz, exactly. Okay. Well, well, is that non-metrical? I mean, boy, I tell you what, those guys did in that period of sometimes it's called cool jazz. That period of jazz, fifties. Do you like that? Do you like that music? Yeah. Well, I. <laughs> I have to say, I like jazz, but then I I bought a a collection of Charlie a Bird and Bird, and yeah you know and I didn't care for it as much. Okay, you know, and they almost did an interesting thing, and you hear this when you hear good jazz players, especially in good bass players, they go off and yes, there there is that metrical structure metrical structure that they've internalized, 
and a harmonic structure that the pianist may be playing at the keyboard. But the soloists there are more thinking in prose, in almost like the chain. I know it's a crazy comparison, and maybe later I'll think, why did I make that? But you brought it up. But <laughs> you see, they're going in a kind of a mathematical prose-like formula that is occasionally seriously linked to the beat and the harmony, which they know internally. But they're freed up to make almost like, I almost you, you think you can see it almost, like firework things happening. They go off in their own rhythms, their own free, non-metrical, non-earth-bound sounds that, that really will not be held down, it seems like, by what's going on that we kind of can clap our hands to. And yet they've never lost sight of that structure, which is why they come back. And when you go hear live jazz with good players, it, it really think, makes you think about, I and mean, the word that comes to my mind, I'm thinking of some very specific players that I've been grateful to be able to hear of an older generation who, who lived through that very time you're talking about and are still here in their 80s and 90s playing. It's like calculus, you know. They are making mathematical formulas in melody that always come back to the principles of the rhythm and the harmony underneath. But boy, along the way, you do not know for sure where they are, and Bird was like that. You know, he's that whole generation. He and his colleagues. A little bit unpredictable. Well, it's not going to come to that 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 structure that makes you think you know all the time what's happening. Right. And and you know with Chan, obviously we're we're trying to talk about Chan, but jazz that has that same kind of freedom. I think it was a very interesting thing for you to bring that in. Um, <laughs> and 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 we don't ever want to think that jazz is here and pop is here and musical expression is here and the music we're supposed to learn about is there and there are these big walls between them. Between them. That's part of what makes it hard to pull the arts together. And we so want to pull there, it all together. Is there a different response, uh, I say, in, in my soul, so to speak, to metrical as opposed to non-metrical music? I think so, and and you know the ancients will, especially in week three, we're talking about instruments, you know that that certain metrical music and rhythm, rhythmic instruments were on the bottom of the hierarchy in ancient Greece, as you will you'll hear in the lesson, and uh, in those cases that was music for dancing, for entertainment, for the festivities, for the Colosseum, you know, for but but sacred music, and free non-metrical music is in prose is, is, is a higher kind of form because the musical voice is higher in the hierarchy. Get, we're getting ahead of ourselves in the course, but that's okay because it all comes together. That's musica humana. And then the highest music was what we call music of the spheres or musica mundana. And then that's the music of God in the Greek view, the ancient Greek view. You know, that this was the moving of the planets. This is the wind. This is the, the music of the stars. When the stars sang together, this is the music that the shepherds looking into the sky felt they weren't singing a melody, but they sensed it. Especially think about ancient times when, when the land was dark and when you were aware of the, the dawn and the dusk and the planets and the, the winds in a way that it's very hard to do in the modern world today. You know, that, that's closer to what people felt must be the music of God. Okay, you mentioned shepherds uh, out underneath the stars because my and I think that's great because my picture of of what you're talking about is 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 basically like discipleship in the form of grandpa sitting by the fire with grandpa and he's teaching me the songs that his father and his grandfather taught him does that make sense to you it, yeah. it's it's like a it's a it's an oral transmission yes. of of discipleship of of teaching that's right, exactly, and that's what was expected. That was what, from ancient times, and we was expected that generation would master and be rigorously taught the body of the heritage, and then it would be brought forth to the next generation. Now, when your grandfather did it to you or your great grandfather, if you with those who are that lucky, lucky, it's okay if they change the little folk song and they make it happen up on the Red River instead of you know on the Missouri River because that's creativity. 
And that's fine. And there was that within the Chan. But when we go back to the way the ancient traditions taught and the way the monastic tradition that we'll be getting into very quickly in this course, or when we go back to the odes, or we go back to the disciplines of how Aristotle and Plato would be speaking about teaching the epic poems in the, in the history, in the body, or when we go back to teaching the Psalms, as we spoke about a great deal in the first unit of this course, the, the body of the Psalms that would be taught orally and still is taught in the monastic settings or we go back to the ancient Hebrew scriptures I've got a long sentence going here I know but that was a rigorous kind of oral transmission so if your grandfather had said to you Paul this is a really important song about how our great granddaddy came over from the old country and I want you to understand son that this really is important in our family history and I'm going to teach it to you and I want you to learn it and learn all the words of this story you would have learned it openly and very carefully because you would have understood it was part of the heritage right and you would have absolutely captured it and then you would turn to your children and say kids <laughs> I mean, isn't that that's a different mentality? You see that that then it gets really focused. And what if you're really, really teaching the heritage to a group of young people who understand they are receiving it? That's what we mean by rigorous teaching. And you practiced it over and over and over every day for years. Then that's not loosey goosey at all. Right. Well, it doesn't seem. Does it seem like we have that much faith in the oral transmission anymore because of this? You know the words get changed you know they when you're talking about a rabbi and his Talmudim his his students like you said they would learn the entire Torah I am talking Genesis through Leviticus word for word right you know and like you said that to throughout really you know a couple thousand years of doing that very little uh, room for error so to speak but like you said, if we if if I'm singing to my daughters, I might change the words a little bit here and there. But I guess you're saying we don't uh, we don't hold it as strictly anymore. Is that correct? Except in those settings where it's being done strictly, because right now right. there are still plenty of children sitting in rabbinical schools learning through oral transmission. Now we have the written to help us, but you know, I'm sure that a good deal of the, of the teaching technique still is relying on the stronger capacities of children to learn by ear, by mu through music and cantillation, the intoning of the text using just a symbol that's not a specific detail of written symbols the way we think we have to have with musical notation, but just these patterns of inflections, the tropes as they're called, or the modal patterns as we'll learn in, in, in the early Christian chant. And there are still kids sitting there right now and there are monastics who are learning by memory in Latin, first maybe in English, but then in Latin learning every one of those psalms very quickly by repetition, repetition through the chant. Well, so do you have some examples of it on, on the website now? Well, we do. I don't have things that we can play today right now over this particular um, loaded up right now. But in our assignments, you know, we are sending people, we, we will be increasingly sending people to hear examples, and we have things coming up in the text. Now, the second unit, of course, in Jerusalem, we're talking a lot about archaeological um, history and the temple and the importance of the first temple, the second temple, and what we know about it. And we'll be showing you some beautiful, beautiful footage uh, through a wonderful archaeologist named Uval Eden, whom we were very blessed to have take us through Jerusalem and speak directly to our students, uh, which he very much does in an engaging manner. People are going to love him. If you haven't seen that unit already, um, he is he was just marvelous. It was like, I, I don't know, Crocodile Dundee, I say, of, of, of the archaeology uh, exploration, you know, that we had. And for him, every stone is singing. Um, but then we got into uh, some wonderful Roman music in Unit 3 with a group called Sinalia um, that again we were very blessed to encounter and to spend time with and experience as they do archaeologically what's called ethno-organology organology the study of instruments ethno ethnographic ethno organology and organologic organological archaeology we can put these terms together as much as you want but the fact is they bring it to sound and to dance and you'll be able to hear that in the unit we have several excerpts and we'll be sending you to more of their music as well and the assignment
And then we'll be moving into really a focus on plain chant as it develops and going back to how people will be singing the Credo, the Kyrie, the Sanctus, uh, Veni Creator Spiritus. We're basically going to do some of the top 10, top 20 of the chants you know, that have come down to us. And we're going to get those hopefully to become very familiar to everybody in this course. So, okay, I keep thinking they've transmitted this down throughout the years, and, and you mentioned how specific it is. Is there a notation to it? Like, how does a person know if they're chanting it correctly? Well, if you were being taught in the ancient tradition, you'd have a master there who would probably be popping your little knuckles <laughs> if you didn't, or your nose, or making you stand on one foot, or whatever. You know, when we look back and see how people uh, prescribed that this would be done, um, you know, it's it strikes us as, oh my gosh, that was so rigorous and cruel and, you know, every, but, <laughs> so, one of the things about notation, again, you know, if you got that rigorous training, you knew very well, but, you know, we end up becoming reliant on notation around 900 AD, 1000 AD, and that's when, you know, we look back and we are so excited once we start finding manuscript excerpts in nine, the, the 10th century, basically 11th century, then there's more in the 12th, and then there's loads of them in the 13th, and then from then on we have written notation. And we'll talk about how that notation developed. It comes from pneumatic symbols, very similar to Hebrew cantillation, to the Torah cantillation, where you, not simple, sim, similar in how they exactly look, but in how they develop. And the Eastern Christian tradition has its own znaki, they're called called uh, signs that were placed above the text. You're familiar with that, Paul, I know. In Torah reading, you've, got, you've, you've learned about that. But, but when we get where the lines and the spaces are there and we can put the little notes in there, we think, in retrospect, in hindsight, culturally, that we've now really achieved accuracy. But one of the things we're going to learn in this course is that I don't care how many symbols you put on lines and spaces and how good they look and how accurate the rhythm gets to be or how representative we still cannot look at that and know for sure all of the beauty and the expression that was brought to it. And oral transmission would be able to convey that 100%. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so specific and absolute is not always better than that master singing to the next generation and making sure they rigorously learned it. Well, in a time where people were less, well, for, for lack of, less... <laughs> Literate, I guess well, you say. Bound to book, bound to the yeah. book form of learning, but absolutely literate in the uh, in the sense of the oral learning. I think they had to have been much better storytellers mm -hmm. and much better listeners. Yep. I think that's one of the things that I've lost personally is my ability to listen. Yes, and I'm you know I'm I'm such a chatterer. <laughs> I'm the worst example of a listen. You know, I, I, I think that's part. Of, we are, look at us with our social media and we're chattering, chattering, chattering and, and we're talking, talking, talking and listening. You know, if you can imagine what it would have been like to be a child, a student, a young man chosen to, to be able to be fortunate enough to be in a rabbinical setting, for example, or a young child in the uh, boys' choir, you know, in, in a, or, or singing in the cathedral choir. You know, those kids knew how they had to listen to survive. They, they knew how to listen. They learned how to listen. Wow. Yeah. And it, and it was not always happening just, just right there by sitting down. I mean, as I understand it, it is described there in Deuteronomy 6. That is... And, and as Jesus himself did, you literally, you followed your rabbi, you followed your teacher physically as well as through words, as well as what he's telling you. You're also, you're, you're experiencing it as he's walking you through, as, he, as, as the scripture says, as you lie down, as you wake up, as you walk mm -hmm. along the way. Yeah. I th sometimes when people say to us, you know, uh, or people who are not familiar with the monastic tradition haven't had the experience of going into convents or monasteries, and we've been really blessed with that. I've been blessed to go into some um, Eastern Christian churches where, although I'm not Eastern Orthodox because I was serving as a translator under certain uh, uh, situations translating for American guests, I was able to accompany. And I tell you what, you know, you talk about go back in time, you talk about go back to a different world, but... Um, just thinking in terms of the environment, you know, people say, well, you know, they're always having services 
four, six, eight times a day, you know, pray. And they say, what, what is that all about? And then, to me, the best way to explain it is that admonition we were given to pray without ceasing. And when you sing the Psalms in offices eight times a day, or when you have the patterns of the recitations, the Shema, and you have, you know, the training that teaches you the worshipful uh, demeanor, and the chants are there, and the text is there, and the understanding is there, and it's been drilled into you. You are praying without ceasing in a way that we just don't know how to do in the modern society very easily. That's true. Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more. And yeah. Thank you for, for doing this course. Is there anything else that... Oh, there's everything else, but, you know, yeah. we're going to get the... Um, we won't have ice next week. We already looked at the forecast, so we'll be able <laughs> to do things a little... But we, at least we got out of off the hill today, so we will get the, uh, the, the visual images that we want to share, and we'll be talking about uh, the archaeology of Jerusalem, the, the temple. Uh, by then, our students will have gone through the tours that we've put up on the assignment, and we have some 3D recreation. Some of you have seen it already. Some of you have. I know because some of you are just now getting started in this course. Don't worry, you'll have plenty of time to do it. We're not loading you up with too much work. We want you to think about it. We want you to discuss it with your family, your friends. But it, we'll be talking about that more and we'll be able to have the questions. We'll be able to get the questions, I'm sure, uh, coming. And I, please send them to me in email if you have them. But we should be able to have it simultaneous when we maybe have Mother Nature cooperating a little bit better with us, yeah? Because um, Mother Nature still dictates a lot, doesn't she? <laughs> Well, I tell you, the the fact that you braved the ice ah. to come to this, well, I really say thank you for that. Well, it was Texas ice, which people up in Minnesota, I know you're laughing at us, but remember, we have one snowplow in our whole county, <laughs> and every once in a while we need it. <laughs> you know? Hey, yeah, uh, I know we, we're here in Florida, and they yeah. had, it was literally 32 degrees, and they shut down I-10, and, uh, you know. <laughs> Just in case, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. I guess I guess maybe if it was minus 32, it would have been better because you know it wouldn't have been as sloshy and wet. Yeah. I don't know, but well, uh, you, you know, know. With the, the people in the ancient world would not have tried to travel, and they wouldn't have tried to collect to satellite connect to satellites. They would have enough sense to stay in where it was warm with a candle and would have sung their psalms, you know, <laughs> and uh, and uh, told their stories and had the kind of community that we still very much, all of us in this course, all of us in this community, believe that singing and praying without ceasing brings together. And that's the goal we really want to keep our eyes on. Amen. That's great. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for letting thank me Thank you, part. Paul. And thank you to all of you there. We will get this uh, interactive going a little stronger, and we look forward to that. And we hope you're enjoying the, the class sessions we, that are always there for you. And we hope you're enjoying the assignments, and let us keep hearing from you. Awesome. Yeah, and I want to make sure that uh, they know that they can watch this. Obviously, they're going to watch the recording, but come join us live and... Type in your questions and your comments as we go. Yes.